ancient bank. When I got there, it was clear that the church is no longer in use. All of the doors and windows were boarded up, and it seemed to be in a state of disrepair. A notice on the side of the building stated that the church had been purchased and was to be converted into a museum. I went round to the back of the church to see if I could find the steps. I'm just standing now at the top of the steps by the side of the church where the alien was taken. I'm just going to go down the steps. You can see it's not very pleasant down here. The steps are very narrow. Okay. And there is a chamber. It smells not too good either. There's a chamber underneath here somewhere. Hello. Wow, it's a little chamber which is about, I'd say about 12 feet by 8 feet. And we're just, we're underneath the floor of the church here. You can see this. It's right beneath the church. An ideal place to store a dead alien. A chilling thought went through my head as I sat in the crypt. Imagine all of the church services which must have taken place during the time the alien was stored underneath. And how they're doing at the back of the, the church? That's where the, the very narrow steps are. Yeah. So have you, can you describe that entrance to the... I, I, don't, I wouldn't go and do it. <laughs> Not lately. The interview with Robert Hall went on for an hour and several other interesting details came out. On the morning he was watching the soldiers some time before he was captured by the aliens, he remembers an extremely bright light zigzagging across the sky which was also spotted by some Australian soldiers. After it went out of sight they didn't pay much attention to it. Robert also remembered a woman holding a baby coming out of the craft shortly after he had been let out. Robert was ill for a few days following the abduction. For two days his eyes watered and he suffered headaches. A small triangular shaped mark appeared on his left cheek which remained until he was about 13. After the events Robert was intimidated and threatened by officials who he presumed were from the army or the government who said that he would be killed if he said anything. A high-ranking man from the Air Force interviewed him and asked him to provide an account of what he saw. He remembers the Air Force official was called Marshall. He handed Robert a child's spinning top and asked him if this is what the craft looked like. At some point, Robert was visited by a reporter from the Evening Chronicle, but he would not say anything. The reporter punched him to try and get the information, and this has been corroborated by his sister Rhoda. For years after the events, Robert remembers being followed to school every day by a man. He even claims that his UFO experience is recorded in his school record. There was clearly a lot to investigate here. Before I started tracing other witnesses, I decided to email Daryl Sims, one of the world's leading experts on alien abduction. In reply to my email, he attached a drawing of what he described as the usual suspects in a typical abduction case. This drawing was so similar to Robert Hall's descriptions, I asked Daryl if he would do an interview over the phone. Daryl Sims has been investigating the alien abduction phenomena for over 30 years and has studied over 1,000 cases worldwide. Daryl agreed to a telephone interview to try and shed some light on Robert Hall's story. Basically, this gentleman contacted me a few months ago and I've interviewed him. You, you know, you've seen a little bit of... Um, a little clip of the interview. Um, if I just basically describe how he describes his abductors, then perhaps you can maybe shed a little bit of light 
um, on, on what I'm saying. He described one of them as being very tall with long blonde hair. Another one he described as being like Bigfoot. Uh, he described the others as all being horrible looking creatures ranging from two foot down, sorry, from four foot down to two foot. And one had what looked like an old fashioned diver's mask on, you know, like the big spherical diver's mask. And he, he claims that it had, um, or may have had liquid in it. Um, I just wondered if you, if, if that, if any of this is common or if you could shed any light on any of it, just down to your knowledge and experience of abductees. The entities that are, first of all, that are found for your, for your audience's uh, interest, uh, the entities that are often described in these events range from a small little gray type creature with large bug eyes mm -hmm. uh, that are usually almond shaped, sometimes perfectly round, uh, to another creature that's a little bit larger than he is, which is often referred to as the doctor. And then the, uh, there is a, uh, a praying mantis type creature that's uh, about uh, five and a half to six to seven foot tall. Mm -hmm. There's a humanoid creature, which we're going to mention and speak about here in a moment. And then there's another creature that looks, for all intents and purposes, for, for those of you that are in the movie, mm -hmm. the movie watch movies a lot, in Star Wars, there was a movie called a, a creature called a Wookiee, uh, and uh, it kind of looks like a giant Bigfoot is what it looks like. And okay. uh, some people describe those creatures as well. The humanoid creature um, that you see on the quote-unquote uh, uh, UFO events or abduction uh, scenarios con or contact scenarios is a human-like creature uh, in, in our um, estimation. Mm -hmm. The human-like creatures have, uh, are, are, not, are not the, they're not human. Is the best way to describe them. They, uh, they're human-like, and uh, there is uh, some who are of the opinion, and I'm one of them, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs at uh, Temple University and uh, Bud Hopkins and myself are three that think that these uh, human entities are, in fact, nothing but uh, a version of uh, the alien in a uh, in a hybrid hybridized form. Okay. That the purpose uh, his purpose here may be to a comfort uh, a human by um, calming him down as an example when mm -hmm. the little entities are going to do whatever they're going to do to you. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he will come in. The best example I can give of this was the uh, the famous Travis Walton case. My friend Travis. Uh, mm -hmm found himself on a craft and uh, was more than mortified when he saw these little creatures coming toward him. Mm -hmm. And he picked up something, and he said, I don't know what it was, it kind of looked like a big wrench. And he said, I was going to hit him with it, stop him from doing coming after me. And mm -hmm. he said, at that point, he said instantly, this large human, very well built, very tall, came in, and all the conversations took place there were mental. And uh, these entities, for the, no one knows the real answer to this, and I've got some ideas, but Basically, they prefer you not to speak on the craft. Mm -hmm. Almost, uh, almost never will you hear speaking. Now you'll hear screaming okay. by the abductee in some cases, but you are not allowed to speak. They don't want you to do that. Okay. And uh, anyway, the uh, the human seems to be a hybridization. Uh, and one at, one might ask the question, well, why in the world would you say something like that? Because what does <laughs> To what end? Well, one of the ends is the fact that uh, they may be useful, uh, not just on the craft, but they may be useful down here. Mm -hmm. In other words, if they wanted to, uh, um, say, cause a reconnaissance down here in, uh, among the humans without being detected, it would be far easier to do it in a human form than it would be with a little bug-eyed guy wandering around here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You'd need about a 50-pound fly swatter to get that guy, so... <laughs> It's going to be far easier to use a human to a humanoid form to uh, be undetectable for the most part. Unless you really knew what you're looking for, you would not detect this guy. One thing. To